So um, this is related, I think, to the workshop and to the question of the workshops in the sense that um, when social movement demand, they also recognize the power legitimacy of the existing political system. And um, I guess the cases I look at, um, um, protest movements try to develop their own power. And I try to address this with Hannah Arendt's understanding of power. Um, Arendt uh, bases her, uh, like many of her ideas, bases also this idea uh, of power on the ancient Greek experience in the polis. She, uh, she knows, she, she, manages, she de develops this concept of isonomy, which is an absence of a division between ruler and ruled. And for her, this is an artificial uh, uh, condition um, that establishes equality. It is constituted, a uh, constituted form of governance. It's important, look, there's not, not this idea that people are already equal. They are unequal. And it's in the space of the polis, it is in this artificial constituted governance of isonomy that people become equal. And this is the condition of freedom. And freedom, importantly, is, and there's already this differentiation um, um, that, that will sort of come with me through this presentation. Uh, freedom is not liberty. So it's a quote from her. Um, the liberties which the laws of constitutional government guarantee are all of a negative character. They claim not a sharing government, but a safeguard against government. And that includes, uh, in her perspective, for example, voting uh, in demonstrations. Uh, voting and but also sort of demanding maybe in demonstrations. Um, freedom in, in opposition to that is the participation in public affairs, the admission to the public realm. Um, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's only in, in, in sort of collectively acting uh, in, a, in a condition of isonomy that we can speak of freedom. Now the importance of course of freedom is uh, to, obviously freedom is connected to a certain openness. Um, free uh, Action is free, in particular in Aaron's concept, because when we act, we have an intention to act, but we act in concert with others. Our action will um, result in someone else reacting, and because we cannot predict that reaction, um, our free action and the free action of others produces contingency. So this is, of course, the condition of freedom, because there's contingency, because things are essentially open, but at the same time it causes a bit of a problem. Contingency means we cannot really know where to go, we have, we have this uncertainty about uh, uh, development. Why is this freedom important? The freedom is important because it, it amounts to uh, what she calls public happiness. And she pinpoints to the American revolutionary experience um, where uh, uh, the American revolution, of course, starting with demands, no taxation without representation. But in the process of formulating this demand, um, towards government, uh, the, uh, the uh, revolutionaries discovered the joy of speech making, decision taking, and, and all those aspects of political action. Um, and, uh, and, and created uh, in that context uh, um, a sense of their own freedom. Why is, uh, why is this so important? It's another concept behind it of an art, a space of appearance. Um, which uh, pertains to our notion of uh, basically of all reality we have. Because while we can think of ourselves as real and our experiences as real, there's always a question whether it's not a dream. But only in concert action with others, in being reflected by others and seen by others, uh, we can ensure uh, that our deeds are remembered, that our, that our lives are, are for real. Hence, it is only in isonomy um, that uh, full happiness can be, uh, can be realized because only then we speak to each other uh, as equals and only then we can uh, witness each other's um, deeds. Any lesser form of government also means less power and also unhappier and less authentic, le less authentic lives. Another important thing in this context is the, the notion of foundation. Power results from people acting collectively in freedom. And, uh, and, and uh, in the space of appearance. And power grows with this freedom. So while power is always existing, 
in uh, well, space of appearance doesn't depend as such on on isonomy. It can be, uh, of course, uh, a, a part of lesser forms of government as well, less free uh, forms of government. Um, essentially, these uh, produce less power. So I'd like to remind you that uh, protests often become uh, powerful insofar as they enable a taste of freedom. Think of the importance of being able to speak in Egypt during the revolution. That was um, most strikingly expressed, I think, by, the, by many of the protesters that for the first time, and many, for many of them in their lives, they felt they could actually speak um, to each other without being, um, without being in fear. So, uh, in that sense, then revolution uh, is also linked to novelty, the foundation uh, of a new republic, a new body politic. Um, if you have that, that experience of intense power, it tends to question the existing power and create a power vacuum. Uh, and into this power vacuum, the question is how do we now, in this vacuum, how do we now fill this vacuum with new power? And the acting uh, in a shared space is, uh, uh, of appearance um, how can we uh, stabilize the uh, isonomy that we've created in this? And this is where, um, where for Hannah Arendt this, this truly revolutionary uh, moment begins in constitutional activity, in the attempt to talk about the ways in which we can stabilize isonomy. Um, now let's link this to protest camps. And I said in the paper, when I started doing research on protest camps, it was a bit of a long stretch to link them to revolution. It seemed like, well, this is like a marginal phenomenon in uh, Western countries. It normally never really leads to anything particular. But um, of course, this has changed. Um, in a view, uh, to look at protest camps is first maybe important then, but to see when they actually emerged. I think it's, it's around the late 60s um, where we can first see this form uh, being produced. They become increasingly visible as a form of protest and political action over those years. Um, and they generally have had very little attention as a form of protest so far. Um, for me, the question has always been why is this in a specific context? And it's also a bit of a, and I make that more explicit in the paper, a bit of a critique of Arendt to say this is not simply about the universal uh, thing that always applies. There's particular conditions which we have to look at and pay attention to in which, um, which those things come to the foreground. This is uh, sort of the ground. Um, some of the ideas that she formulates a bit. Okay, so why do they become so important? I think the late 60s is a, is a period of time where there's increasing desire um, uh, expressed for autonomy across society, really. There's a real sense, I think, in the 50s and 60s that um, I'm talking about the West, but of course, when you look at the East, it's very, uh, very similar, if, 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 if more, exp uh, uh, more uh, even accentuated, in the sense that we have huge collective organization, um, and very low level of autonomy for the individual and in all this, for this production, but also in, in the sense of how democracy is organized uh, through, main, through big major parties and through um, um, big unions and so forth. Very little space, therefore, uh, for uh, maybe a sense of um, appearing in, uh, in, in, in public for the individual. Um, as new social movements emerge, there's hence also a search for new organizational forms of those movements. It's not, not simply about new demands, but it's also about trying to do politics in a new way. And the key term here, of course, is prefigurative politics, to align the means and ends of politics. In the left, particularly, this pertains to the question of organization. So um, if we want to um, if we want to come to a society of, of more equality and, 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 and justice, then of course we should organize our political forms in the same way. We should not have uh, patriarchal organizations. We should not have centralized organizations, but we should have more horizontal uh, and more, uh, more um, well, more organization that is uh, parallel or similar or relevant, I think, to this idea of isonomy, to the, uh, to the notion of uh, non-separation between the rulers and the rule, to an idea of um, uh, an, 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 a constructed equality. So there is attempts that start in this time to formalize this, to come to ways of decision making and, 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 process, uh, and processes uh, uh, that are reflective of these ideas. And uh, HDM, horizontal decision making, emerges in this time. Um, uh, 
and this has been much discussed, I think, uh, uh, the, the various aspects of it and how it's developed, it's also very clear that there, uh, there are certain limits to this type of decision making, in a sense that um, they often limited to smaller groups, they're often limited to very local contexts, um, and the attempt to um, roll them out in the US, I think, uh, most, uh, most uh, vividly pursued on a more broader level, uh, tended to produce a lot of problems. Um, in, the, uh, in the development of protest camps, at the same time, I see an answer to these problems. I see an answer in a sense that they allow, uh, uh, for reasons I'll come to, uh, they allow to, uh, to have this uh, moment of uh, horizontal, of, 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 of isonomy, of, uh, of shared decision in a larger context. But um, how do protest camps come there? I mean, historically, they don't develop as, uh, oh, let's do a protest camp as this kind of space. They develop out of particular demands. Um, important cases in the 1970s are actually building sites occupation. So you have a plan for a nuclear power plant and people come in to occupy um, the place where the power plant is supposed to be built and, and the, the occupation lasts for several months and that leads to the, sort of this living in a shared context. So they are often based on demands initially. But then in this shared occupation, the power, the potential power of the place becomes tangible. I think it has much to do with the territorial boundaries. Um, I don't know if any of you have been to a protest camp, but more often if you enter it, you have to go through uh, police lines. You're being checked and searched and so forth. And then you, on the other side, there's a welcome tenant. You're mostly more friendly. Uh, uh, it's a more friendly experience, but still, you know, you're, you're on the other side of the border. Um, so in that sense, I think they enable this foundational moment that they are forming body politics. Um, so, in a sense, they move from demands to more constitutional activity. What is particular, I think, about the constitutional activity that takes place in protest camps is that, okay, for once, they enhance, and historically, uh, there's a bit of that in the paper, historically improve or show, I think, how the development of like, um, horizontal decision making, for example, as a process, was enhanced in, through the experience in protest camps. Um, and it's practiced in there a lot. It's, it's one of the places where you can actually do it with a lot more people than, uh, than, uh, than at home. That has to do, I think, with another form of constitutional activity that is less focused on processes and roles and more focused on space. So for once, it's already mentioned this fact that you're kind of building a territory, um, forming a territory, and you have, uh, you, you're antagonistic towards the outside, which mean, leads to unity within. But then also very interesting, many of the protest camps develop a decentralization. They say, we're diverse. Uh, how do we manage the diversity? Well, we put different, pe different groups of people into different neighborhoods, barrios, um, as they develop. And again, you can show from the 60s to today how this idea of a neighborhood structure becomes a, almost a formalized thing in protest camps. So I think these are experiments in isonomy, sharing power to increase it. And so the relationship between revolution and revolutionary spirit becomes important in the sense that these camps garner an intense experience of power. And um, they can lead to, uh, to revolution. But they often also uh, simply impress something I would, and Hannah Arendt calls the revolutionary spirit. She incidentally uh, sees that in, um, in, in uh, uh, civil disobedience, right? She discusses civil disobedience as, uh, as something that should be protected by the Constitution. And hence also my idea, maybe for the discussion, maybe for us. Um, first, however, the question what happened to Occupy? What happened to the uh, March, uh, May 15th demonstrators in, in Spain? What happened to these camps? Well, one thing I think is significant is that there's a tendency to move into communal politics. That there's an idea to go back to the initial neighborhoods of the city and try to implement these forms of, um, of uh, isonomy, of ruling without a division of uh, rulers and rule, of uh, experiencing power together in, in a communal politics. But also, um, maybe more worryingly, I think we see post-2011 that across the Western world, and of course beyond uh, anyway, we see a crackdown on protest camps in various ways. There's a legal, there's legal processes by which sleeping in tents is prohibited. You have court cases in which um, judges say, well, it's okay to bring a tent, but once you sleep in it, 
that's not okay because that, that's not a protest anymore. But I think, well actually, if, if they have these kind of importance, potentially, then uh, maybe we need to approach this totally differently. Maybe we have to see them as, as very, uh, very crucial um, to uh, revive, uh, um, if you want, revolutionary spirit. And maybe we should give them, therefore, uh, more protection um, and, uh, and, and, and embed them into sort of the, uh, sort of the forms uh, of, uh, of uh, public action that, uh, that are, in that sense, protected. Um, I'm done. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.